Dear Dad, It's strange that I said goodnight to those people. Sometimes, though, you just say things without knowing why. It's four in the afternoon, and I'm at the Summerfest, Milwaukee, a huge outdoor and music comedy festival. It's nice here, and people seem like they are having lots of fun. But I don't think I'll ever get used to performing in the afternoon. You can see everybody in the crowd. It lets you know who your audience is, or at least how they look. Mine seems to be fairly attractive, but, you know, looks are deceiving. I mean, here I am making everyone laugh. People walking by would think, he's having a great time. But what I'm thinking and what I'm saying are two different things. Isn't that true a lot? I mean, on stage I was saying, this is my family. Aren't they funny? But as I looked at the audience, women holding babies, men swinging beer, kids being reprimanded by their parents, and as they laughed, I was thinking, don't you see, this isn't really funny. Or at least it wasn't to me. Anyway, about halfway through this afternoon's show, I asked, anybody here with their parents? I do that in all my shows. A young man in his 20s, seated in the front, raised his hand and pointed to an older man one seat away. His dad shot him a look that seemed to say, hey, don't get me involved in this. So I started in on his father. What's your name? Ed. Everyone in the Midwest is named Ed or Dick. I said, what do you do, Eddie? If looks could kill, my routine would have ended early and I'd be on trial for comic slaughter. Mechanic, he said. You work on cars? I asked without wanting an answer. My dad loved his car. He had a Bonneville. He'd introduce it to people, here's my Bonneville, he'd say, and then he'd motion behind him and kind of half-heartedly mumble, here's my family over there, thinking about trading them in. No, I'm just kidding, I said. It's nice that you and your dad are doing things together. The only thing my dad and I did together. Then, honestly, Dad, I stumbled. I couldn't think of anything to say. I could hear my mind saying, make up something, you idiot. I thought for a moment and said, the only thing my dad and I did together was complain. But I shouldn't complain, because if my family was normal, I'd probably be asking, may I take your order, please? God, I'm glad I got out of that. But really, Dad, what did we do together? I can't think of anything. Or at least I can't think of anything fun. I guess maybe I should complain about that. After all, a boy's got a right to share some quality time with his dad. But funny how we're taught not to complain. Mom, I remember whining on those cold Minnesota mornings, I hate going to school. Don't complain, you'd snap. When I was a kid, we didn't have schools. We had to find smart people and follow them around. I would mumble under my breath, guess you didn't find anyone, did you? Frankly, this letter might sound like I'm complaining. I hope not. I've been meaning to write for a long time. Six years ago, I got the idea from a friend of mine. I drove him to Duluth, Minnesota, so he could say some things to his father. At first, I thought it was kind of strange. Going to a cemetery to read letters to your father? But I cared for my friend. So I dropped him off on that bright, sunny day, and when I picked him up two hours later, his eyes were red. The letters were gone, and he seemed like a different person. Everything okay? I asked. Fine, he said. Just fine. And then he was quiet till we got nearly home. You know, my dad and I never really got along, he said in a soft voice. I don't know why. I always hoped we would. But we didn't. It's good, though, that I discussed it with him. I feel better now. I didn't quite understand, at least then, but I never forgot that day. And I always hoped that day would come for me and you. Nine years after your death, today I mean, it suddenly hit me. It hit me as I was talking to that guy and his dad from on stage and couldn't remember doing anything with you. I remember you, and I remember me, but I don't remember us. I thought about that all the way back to the hotel. I ride in the back of a new Chrysler donated by a local dealer. The guy who drove me was in his late fifties. He wore a blue suit that looked old. He turned around and asked, Mind if I smoke? I shook my head and rolled down my window, staring out of the sea of beer-drinking people in the Bermudas as he wove his way through the crowd. I didn't know anyone in Los Angeles who smokes. But as he lit his cigarette, it reminded me of you and how you loved to smoke. You always smelled of smoke, and there was a yellow nicotine mark beneath your index and middle fingers that even the Undertaker couldn't get out. Yeah, smoke and Old Spice, I thought. You always smelled of smoke and Old Spice. You splashed it on you after you shaved, but even after a shave, your beard was still rough. Someone once asked me what you looked like. It was hard for me to answer because I never really think about it. Not too many pictures of you exist. But now I can see you clear as the man who was driving a Chrysler. Only you would have been honking and cussing at the people walking in front of the car. That and you would have had a beer between your legs. I was glad when the ride was over. I got out of the car and said, see you in two hours, and then headed for my room. It's an old hotel where I'm at. The hallways have that musty smell of age. And as I entered my room, I wondered if you had ever stayed there when you were on the road with Hoagie Carmichael. All the furniture in my room is new except for a big old desk by the window. 
It looked like a good place to write something. So I sat down, opened the drawer, found a pad of stationery, and began to write. Signed, Trying to Remember Us. Louis Anderson was a stand-up comic. I rarely listened to stand-up comedians, not really my thing. And oddly enough, I really didn't know about this aspect of his life until talking to Jace. Yes, that Jace, who, in his own way, inspired this video. I talked to him about his other well-known work months ago. Just to preface, I didn't even know Sergeant Slaughter was a wrestler until the 2000s. I only knew him from G.I. Joe, so cut me some slack. Concerning Louis Anderson, though, if you're my age or perhaps younger and living in Europe, you know him more as a star of a slice-of-life comedy cartoon called Life with Louis. Premiering in 1994 on Fox Kids, this cartoon was conceptualized by the aforementioned comedian as a light-hearted, partial retelling of his childhood in Minnesota during the 1960s. I remember watching this show fondly as a kid, but only started to revisit it after my talk with Jace. Upon revisiting it, I find it much funnier as an adult. But there was one specific aspect of its production that truly surprised me. You see, cartoons based on famous people was common in the 90s often starting with the real person beginning the show with a live-action segment. Pro Stars is an example of this, and so is the Jackie Chan adventures years later. However, the real-life people didn't voice their characters. Life with Louie followed that same basic format with one exception. He actually voiced his child self, as well as his father in the show throughout the entire run of three seasons, totaling 39 episodes. As I'm sure all of you know by now, though, Louie Anderson passed away this month so I decided to check out some of his stand-up for the first time, and I was surprised to see how much of his stand-up influenced the show directly, sometimes line for line. Maybe one day I'll cover the whole series, but today I just want to cover two of the episodes. Specifically, A Fish Named Pepper and The Thank You Note. A Fish Named Pepper starts out with a few things going on. Louis's grandma visiting, much to his father's chagrin, his friend Jeannie moving, and Louis wanting to get a pet due to the previous friend moving. The main focus here, other than the comedic prodding between Andy and Grandma... I almost forgot to tell you. I was out in the garage today, and I reorganized all your tools for you. What? Is that Louis is sad that Jeannie is moving. Not just because his friend is leaving, but because he clearly has a crush on her. He goes to his father Andy for advice, only for his dad to just tell him to ask Jeannie if her father's parking space at the plant is available. This is something Louis awkwardly blurts out to Jeannie in his attempt to tell her how he feels with Jeannie leaving and Louis not knowing what to do. But Louis isn't as alone as he thinks. His grandma picks up on his mood in a way that only grandmas can, and recommends he write her how he feels, and to mail it to her, which leads to this exchange. What if she laughs? What if she doesn't? The episode ends with the status quo returned as Jenny shows up on Louis's doorstep to inform him that her dad's job didn't work out, so they're back, and that she got his letter. I don't fault the show for this. It was, after all, still the first season of the show. But here's where I have to comment on something that baffles me. Despite the quality of this show, practically no one talks about it here on YouTube. To put this in perspective, there are more people talking about dinosaurs than there are people talking about Life with Louie. That's not to cast shade at dinosaurs. That show is rad. I just want to point out how obscure this show seems to be in cartoon discourse, even as a 90s cartoon. After Louis's death, I had found that he wrote a book called Dear Dad, Letters from an Adult Child. That's what the opening of this video is from. It's a book that contains multiple letters he wrote to his now-past father. I brought this up with Jace, noticing the similarities between A Fish Named Pepper and the concept of this book. That's when Jace told me I need to look at one very specific episode that was far more likely inspired by this book, the thank you note. In this episode, Louis is told several times that he needs to write a thank you note to his grandma for the sweater she gifted him. However, like kids often do, he let fun get in the way of that, only to one day find his mother crying. He promises to write the letter now, only for his mother to inform him that his grandmother is gone. The entire episode centers on that grief. Even the school bully refrains from messing with Louis during most of this. Louis seeks out multiple religious leaders to try and find Heaven's address so he can send his grandmother a letter, clearly not understanding what death really is. Meanwhile, his mother is refusing to rest, trying to keep the spirits of herself and her family up. And Andy, while always antagonistic towards Grandma, was tasked with her eulogy, and moves from being spiteful to fondly remembering her. This all comes to a head when Louis, after talking to a Buddhist, is worried his Grandma was reincarnated as an insect. His mother is called in to handle it, and to explain to Louis what's happened. At the funeral, Andy gives a truly decent eulogy. Well, the truth is, 
Henrietta, or Granny, as I like to call her, was one heck of a woman. She was lots of things. Tough. She was the toughest I've seen. And remember, I've been in combat. If we'd have had Granny in World War I, you can bet your best pair of loafers there wouldn't have been a sequel. She was also kind. And she was strong. And she could laugh. Usually she was laughing at me. But let's face it, usually I deserved it. Grandma was part of my family. And she still is. I see her in my wife. And I see her in every one of my kids. And every time I look at them, I know I'll always love Granny. And I'll always remember her. Louis decided to just read the letter to her at her grave. While heartfelt, the episode ends on a comedic note of Grandma apparently sticking Andy with all of her debt, just to mess with him one final time. If you paid attention to the first segment, you'll see the obvious similarities. Obviously, it played out differently between these two episodes, but the idea of writing to someone who isn't there anymore is still there. And for the record, these two episodes weren't back-to-back. A fish named Pepper was a year before the thank you note. Grandma was an established character by that point. But was it Louis's letters that inspired it, though? Well, let's look at the timeline. Louis's father, Andy, passed away in 1977. Going sidetrack for just a moment, Louis was born in 1953, by the way. He's two years older than my own parents. My grandparents on my old man's side are still around, so the idea that his are gone is kind of surreal to me. But that's just me. Anyways, in the first letter, Louis says it had been around nine years since his father passed, putting the first letter in 1986. This book was published in 1989. A Fish Named Pepper was released in 1995, and the Thank You Note was released in 1997. With as close as Louis worked on the production, I think it's safe to say these episodes, the last particularly, was inspired by these letters. There's something in the backdrop that needs to be addressed, though. In the show, Louis's father, Andy, is a grumpy but lovable curmudgeon. In reality, though, he was a verbally and emotionally abusive man, per this excerpt. We all knew the night was going to get really bad when you downed the last beer and then pulled out a gallon of wine. The stress on us was enormous. Exhausted after one of these evenings, I would fall into bed, only to be woken up a few hours later by a voice loud enough to rattle windows. You'd be calling mom a whore. Lots of times then, you'd open my door, flick on the light, and yell, Hey, Lord! When are you going to lose some weight? I don't think you love me. Maybe you did, but I never felt it. I wonder how the rest of the family felt. No one talks about it. But your drinking did affect us. Roger, Rhea, Jim, Bill, Shanna, they all drank. I did too for a while. Like me, they all found a way to quit. But Dad, your problem became my problem. All of our problem. problem. A valid question to ask then is, why? Why portray a man that has put you through hell in a fairly positive light? I think to Louis it's because he didn't want to demonize his father, especially the children. He had long since forgiven his father and wanted to demonstrate the humanity his mother taught him. Do I get it? Yeah. Is it going to ruin my opinion of the show, knowing what his father is really like? Well, no. While I personally disagree with that move, I'm more of a brutal reality person, it's his move to make. His show, his vision. And one far more deeply personal than a random reboot dropped on the people that don't care about it. I can criticize the execution, or the reason, but at the end of it... That was Louis's business, and his alone. Dear Dad is a book that's entire purpose is to exemplify why you should get answers when you can, and to try and seek reconciliation if possible. While that's not something I can do in my own life due to things outside my control, I highly recommend people take these lessons to heart. Death can come suddenly, and scripture says no man is promised tomorrow. While I'm an adherent to them, I know many aren't, but that statement is true even divorced from the initial text. Dear Dad and these two episodes of Life with Louie, their entire purpose is to tell you to live in the now, to care for those close to you, and to never let a day go by where they don't know how you feel. Life with Louie is a fantastic show, and really needs more recognition. You won't get any real action, and it's not zany in its comedy like many of its contemporaries, but it's absolutely worth it. And go call your grandma. She wants to hear from you. If you like my content, feel free to support me on Patreon via the link in the description. Or join the public Discord to just hang out. Until next time, take care.